So in this clip I'll talk about detecting heteroscedasticity, which we know to be uh, a breach of one of our Gauss-Markov assumptions, namely the homoscedasticity Gauss-Markov assumption. So let us first state the regression model we are talking about, so its basic model. Think about xi potentially being a vector rather than just a scalar variable, and we'll abbreviate the test as BP. So the important thing is to recognize that what Proch and Pagan propose is that the variance of the error terms UI can change. They can be time varying if you have time series data, but they could just change they change across observations. That's important. And they could change as a function, so a generic function g of xi, that's the variable that's in our regression model, but also potentially of another variable, mi here, which is labeled it like that, and that is a variable that just doesn't appear in the conditional mean model for yi, but for some reason may be, a fun uh, may be relevant for the variance of the error terms. And we'll just collect both these variables xi and mi in a new variable called z. Okay, so z i includes both xi and mi. So Proch and Pagan use an auxiliary regression approach, and here it is. What we have is we estimate our original regression model and we save the ui hats from there, as usual. And once we have these ui hats, we square them and we use the ui hat squares as our dependent variable in our auxiliary regression approach. So it's important to recognize here that these ui hat squares, we use them because they are a proxy of our variance at time ui. That's the same idea here which we use for byte standard errors. Okay, there we use the ui hat squares as proxies of the variances as, as well. And then on the right hand side, we put all the variables we hypothesize, and this is really the decision of the econometrician. We put all the variables which we hypothesize may influence the variance. So everything we suspect that has an impact on sigma i squared and will proxy sigma i squared with u i squared hats. So then in this auxiliary regression approach the null hypothesis is that we have homoscedastic residuals. In that case the error variance should be constant. In that case all these terms should be irrelevant. Gamma should be equal to zero and therefore the r squared should be equal to zero. However, if we have heteroscedastic residuals, we would expect at least one of these coefficients to be unequal to zero and therefore the right-hand side variables to have explanatory power for variation in ui hat squared and therefore the r squared should be larger than zero. How do we test this? The test statistic we use, as usual for auxiliary regression approaches, is n times r squared where that r squared is the r squared from the auxiliary regression and n is the number of observations in the auxiliary regression. So of course the r squared is the key as we saw with our hypothesis that will differentiate whether we have evidence against the null hypothesis or not. This test statistic is chi-square distributed. We know chi-square distribution has a degree of freedom parameter. We'll label it k. And k is the number of restrictions tested in the null hypothesis. So therefore it's not a coincidence that here we have k coefficients. So we have k coefficients which we test whether they are equal to zero or not. Therefore k Increase of freedom. So let's use an example for the Proch Pagan test.
All right, here we go. We have our regression model, which we stated before. Okay, y uh, dependent variable, and we have a vector x i potentially, but here in our case, it's going to be a scalar of the explanatory variables. Now, what we think, what we hypothesize for this example is that the variance is also a function of e to the xi. Now, e to the xi here is an example of this m variable. e to the xi variable, e to the xi doesn't appear as a variable in our conditional regression model, but we think it may be relevant to explain variation. So here's our auxiliary regression. Remember, we estimate the regression model, we save the residuals as ui hat squared, calculate the squared residuals, and then use these as the dependent variable in a new regression model. As explanatory variables, we have here a constant. You always have to use a constant in this context xi and e to the xi and the test statistic is going to be n times r squared and n we can see in this regression output to be 30 and the r squared appears here in the regression output so to calculate the value of the test statistic we just got to multiply these two guys and the decision rule it's going to be that we reject H0 if the calculated test statistic LM is larger than the critical value. This makes sense because only for large values of R squared we collect evidence against H0 for the alternative hypothesis. So just a little picture of a chi-square distribution here with two degrees of freedom. Our critical value at say 5%, alpha 5% is 5.99. So we know that at a value of 5.9915 to be precise, the value underneath the distribution to the right of that value is 5%. So this will always be right tail tests because only large values of R squared indicate a rejection of the null hypothesis. So let's calculate what our test statistic is, 6.96246. So let me write this down, let me squeeze that in here, 6.96 approximately. Of course, that value is to the right of the critical value and therefore we reject H0 according to our decision rule. What does that mean? It means we reject the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity and we establish that there is evidence at an alpha of 5% that the error terms display heteroscedasticity. So that would be our conclusion from this testing procedure. So whenever you do a test, never forget to state the decision rule. It's really important. So let's move on to the white test. So it turns out that the white test is really a special case of the proch pagan test. So recall that for the proch pagan test, the proposition was that the variance could potentially be the function of any sort of variable those included and those not included in the regression model. So now for the Y test, if you have your regression, your explanatory variable from the regression model being XI, that could be a vector, of course, again, then for the Y test, we propose that the variance could be a function of the XI and of the squared value. So how do we proceed? First, as before, we estimate that regression model and save the residuals in UI hat. And the next step is going to be that we will calculate the squared estimated residuals, ui hat squared, and we use the following auxiliary regression, ui hat squared, as for the proch pagan test, it's the dependent variable, and as the explanatory variable, we use our explanatory variable, variable or variables, 
and the squared values of these. So we have two terms here because in our example we had a scalar explanatory variable. The null hypothesis is that both these terms are irrelevant, so gamma 1, gamma 2 equal to 0. If that is the case, the R squared of this auxiliary regression should be 0. If that's not the case, then the right-hand side variables will have some explanatory power and the R squared is going to be larger than 0. And again, we will decide between homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity depending on how big the R squared or more precisely the test statistic n times r squared is. So everything is as in project paying, it's just that the choice of the explanatory variables in the auxiliary regression is sort of predetermined by the variables in our regression model. Again, this test statistic is asymptotically chi-squared distributed with k degrees of freedom. Here we are including two terms in the auxiliary regression, therefore k is equal to 2. So let's see how we are using the same example, our regression model y with yi as dependent variable and xi as explanatory variable. And if you in eViews go to view and residual test, there's actually an option for the y test. And so we have that here. So I, I chose that option. And you can see the resid squared with the dependent variable. So we, what we can see here is the auxiliary regression. So we can see the dependent variable and its explanatory variable xi and xi squared. x and x squared and a constant. So we need n and r squared. n is 30 as before. Here is our r squared, 0.18. And therefore we can calculate our n times r squared is 30 times the r squared. The decision rule, let's use 5% again. We checked H0 if the LM test is larger than 5.9915, which was the critical value for 2 degrees of freedom and 0.05. Now when we calculate the value of the test statistic, we get 5.424. And therefore, our decision is that we do not reject H0 as the LM test is smaller. So here we don't reject. Actually, before we do that, let's quickly look at the p-value. Let's go to the chi-square table. We can see we're interested in the k equals 2 row. Our test statistic is between the critical value for 10% and the critical value for 5%. Therefore, what we know is that our critical value is so our test statistic is somewhere here, I just went up to the previous picture, and we can already see that the p-value, which of course is represented by the area underneath the distribution to the right, that this area is larger than 0.05, oh, sorry, that was the 10% criti critical value, here's our test statistic, so the area for the test statistic is somewhere between 5% and 10%. So 4.6, uh, that was the 10% uh, critical value. So the p-value is somewhere between 5 and 10%. Let me just write that down. So one way to writing this is like this. Okay, so somewhere between 5 and 10%. So now, of course, here we decided that we don't have a heteroscedasticity problem on the basis of xi and xi squared, but on the basis of xi and e to the xi using exactly the same data, or we used exactly the same data set. Here we came to the conclusion that there was heteroscedasticity. So the e to the xi is sort of the difference. And so it appears that this term has the potential to explain some of the variation, but it's sort of a marginal decision here. Okay, so the p-value is somewhat above and below 5%. Now for the white test, if we have more than one explanatory variable, for instance here xi and zi, okay, so th this one here is our 
regression model. We would estimate this, save the UI as before, calculate the auxiliary regression which uses UI hat squared as the dependent variable and as I said before what we do is we include all the XI's and ZI's and the XI squared and ZI's now if you have more than one variable you also have to consider cross terms okay it's sort of like a second moment type of variable now you have the option and you use as well you have the option where you want to include these green terms now if you have more than two variables you often get a lot of these cross terms and therefore one sort of rule of thumb is that if you have very many explanatory variables you do not the cro use the cross terms why well if you were to include them your degree of freedom parameter would mushroom, so to say. There would be um, a lot of degrees of freedom because you would have a lot of different cross terms. Now what happens to the chi-square distribution if you increase the degrees of freedom parameter? It sort of moves like this. I started with small degrees of freedom. This is a schematic scheme. And as I move to the right here, the degrees of freedoms were increasing. What does that mean for the critical value? I'll just indicate critical values. They would just be increasing as well. That means it becomes more difficult to reject the null hypothesis. So a critical value increase and therefore remember our decision rule we would need higher and higher R squared to reject the null hypothesis. And therefore we're we sometimes just decide to not include these cross terms because in, well, we're putting our hurdle very high. So in this particular case, the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity assumes that all coefficients are equal to zero. The alternative that any of the coefficients is unequal to zero or equivalently the R squared is larger than zero. Test statistic as usual, n times R squared, chi squared distributed here with five degrees of freedom because we include five terms. So that was the uh, white test and we'll continue with testing for a different type of heteroscedasticity. So here I borrowed a picture which you had earlier that is the change in the US dollar UK pound exchange rate and so this we have time series data uh, just a little bit of background, just imagine that you had written down a model which you used to calculate expectations of yt conditional on information available t minus 1. So that could be an AR model, okay, an ultra-regressive model we talked about before. If you do that with this sort of series, you will see that this conditional expectation is approximately zero because there's very little to forecast and therefore the yt is going to be approximately equal to the error term. So you can think of this graph as displaying also the error term. Okay. So now if you look at this, there are periods in here when the size of the error terms are small, that's the green periods, and other periods when the absolute size or the variation in the error term seems to be larger, the red periods. So it appears as if the variance of the error terms is certainly changing and in our case it's changing with time different time periods different error variances now in the Proch Pagan test framework could we use that well we could use a time trend potentially as an explanatory variable and we do that quite often in econometrics that we use a time trend just as a normal variable what do I mean by a time trend a variable which just counts up time periods, one, two, three, up to capital T, if you have capital T observations. So could we use that in a proch pagan test? Because usually we can treat that as a sort of explanatory variable. But the problem is that we would have to propose that the variance is some sort of monotonic function of time. So either increasing all the time or decreasing all the time. But clearly in our particular example, this is not the case. So what we see here are what are called volatility clusters. So we have periods of large variance followed by periods of large variance or periods of low variance followed by period of low variance with exceptions, of course. Sometimes there are changes, 
We call this sort of pattern autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. So how can we test whether this type of heteroscedasticity exists? If that exists, it has just the same consequences as our usual heteroscedasticity. Here's our regression model, yt dependent variable, xt explanatory variable, and we have a lag dependent variable, yt minus one. So like an enhanced autoregressive model or an ADL model, as we sometimes call it. A very simple one. So what we do is we estimate this model by OLS and save the residuals in UT hat as usual. Then we run an auxiliary regression with UT hat squared as the dependent variable. We have T subscripts now to indicate we have time series data. And the explanatory variables which we use uh, so ut hat squared because well that's a proxy of the variance. Now remember what we said, we have high variances followed by high variances. So there's dependence between consecutive variances. Now our proxies for the variance are the ut hat squared. So if consecutive variances are possibly related to each other, then consecutive estimated variances could potentially be related. So therefore we just use lagged versions here, k lags of this. How many to include? That's an empirical question. Um, if you have monthly data you may want to include up to 12 lags for instance. Now the null hypothesis is that all of these are irrelevant and therefore r squared equals to zero. Okay? Null hypothesis, the variance is constant and therefore lag variances shouldn't matter. The alternative is that one of these coefficients is unequal to zero, which would imply that the R squared is larger than zero. And therefore, the variable on the left-hand side can partially be explained, the varia variation in the left-hand side variable can partially be explained by the explanatory variables. The rest is boring, same old stuff. Test statistic is n times R squared. This is asymptotically chi-squared distributed with k degrees of freedom. K, the number of restrictions, in our case K, whatever it is, however many lags, say 12 if you use monthly data and decide to include 12 lags. Otherwise, exactly the same. So, this is a very important type of test because in time series data we'll often have this type of heteroscedasticity. So I should mention that, of course, sometimes when we have time series data, instead of the sample size, may sometimes be labeled with capital T, um, sometimes with little n. So you just need to know what that means. So we have the number of observations in the auxiliary regression. Now, of course, that means that sometimes we are losing some observations. If, for instance, let's say in the original regression model, we have 105 observations and let's say we include what shall we say let's say in our example k is equal to 3 that means we are losing 3 observations from the original model that means the number of observations in the auxiliary regression is going to be 105 minus 3 is going to be equal to 102 so when you use time series data and you uh, include lag variables, you're losing observations, you have to be aware of them. Here we have three regression plots. Just to, to conclude this, the last one looks a little bit like arch-type heteroscedasticity. Okay, so we have periods with low variances, periods with high variances, but no clear trend. So that looks like an arch-type heteroscedasticity, and you may want to test for that type. If you have time series data, again, this looks like there could be heteroscedasticity, but this looks less arch-type. The top one, there is no obvious heteroscedasticity pattern. So let me just briefly say what would we do for the middle test. Firstly, if you have time series data, you should consider that the variance could either depend on time, but it could also depend on an explanatory variable. But it's very often the time dependence that's important. The middle case where we 
it looks like we have heteroscedasticity. This almost looks like we have a break in heteroscedasticity. So you could include a dummy variable here to test for this type of heteroscedasticity, or what perhaps you're creating a dummy variables for the second subsample. So I think my daughter decided that I've worked enough. I think so too. I wish you much fun with this lecture.